Your Lungs by George Fiddleworth Locating the Lungs Take a deep breath. Now breathe out. You couldn't live without breathing. You couldn't breathe or live without your lungs. You have two lungs in your chest. The one on the left is a little smaller, so there is room for your heart. What they do? You breathe in a gas the body needs called oxygen. You breathe out a waste gas called carbon dioxide. The lungs work with many other body parts to make this happen. Together, they're called the respiratory system. Breathing in. Each lung rests on a sheet of muscle called the diaphragm. It helps the lungs fill with air and empty. When you breathe in through your nose or mouth, the air goes in a tube called the trachea. The trachea connects to two tubes called the bronchi. Each of these tubes leads to one of the lungs and to smaller tubes called bronchioles. Bronchioles lead to tiny sacs called alveoli. Each sac is covered by tiny blood vessels carrying blood that needs oxygen. The alveoli allow oxygen to pass through their thin walls and enter the blood. Blood with oxygen goes to the heart, which pumps it throughout the body. Oxygen for life. Every cell in your whole body needs oxygen to live. Every cell also needs to get rid of waste. The blood that receives oxygen also lets go of its carbon dioxide. This waste gas goes into the alveoli. Breathing out. When you breathe out, everything happens in reverse. The waste air leaves the alveoli and goes out the bronchioles, the bronchi, and the trachea. You let it out through your mouth and nose. Then it happens all over again. It's a trap. Your lungs are lined with sticky mucus that can trap harmful things you breathe in, such as germs and bits of dust. You breathe or cough out these things so they don't stay in your body. Love your lungs. Luckily, you don't have to remember to breathe. Your brain makes sure you do it, even when you're sleeping. You can do things to keep your lungs healthy, such as exercising and staying away from smoke. Love your lungs. Your Stomach by George Fiddleworth Your Super Stomach Your stomach is an organ that's shaped like the letter J. It's found in the upper left side of your belly. The stomach has several jobs. It stores food. It breaks it down for the body's use. It also kills germs in food. The stomach of an adult is about 10 inches, 25 centimeters long. However, it can stretch a lot. When your stomach is empty, it has folds in its sides. The folds disappear as the stomach fills with food and liquid. Your digestive system. The digestive system is made up of many body parts that work together to turn food into forms that the body can use. Your stomach is just one organ in your digestive system. However, it's a very important organ. Digestion starts in your mouth before you even begin to eat. Glands in the mouth release saliva or spit before you take your first bite. Once you take a bite, saliva begins to break down food. You break it down by chewing, too. When you swallow, the food goes into a tube called the esophagus. Muscles move to push the food down the esophagus into the stomach in just a few seconds. You swallow air, too. That's why you burp. Glands in the stomach release digestive juices. These strong liquids break down food even more and kill germs. The juices could harm the stomach, so the stomach is lined with mucus. Stomach muscles mix the food and juices. Some foods, such as meats and beans, may stay in the stomach for five hours. However, sugars travel through the stomach in as quickly as one hour and don't make us feel as full. The stomach moves all food to the small intestine next. In the small intestine, juices from the liver and pancreas break down food more. The food's nutrients are taken into the body. What's left over travels into the large intestine. The last nutrients are removed and the solid waste is pushed out. What's that sound? Even when your stomach's empty, the muscles still move. That's why your stomach makes sounds when you're hungry. Make sure you eat healthy food to give your stomach and the rest of your body parts the many nutrients they need. Puss and Scabs by Melvin Hightower Ouch! It's never fun to get a cut. You might start to bleed. It also hurts a lot. While your cut heals or mends, you might see pus and scabs. But it's okay. That's your body working to make you better. Cut too deep. 
Your skin is an amazing organ. It's the first line of defense in your immune system. It's made of many layers that work to keep you safe. When you get a cut deep in your skin, it opens a blood vessel and you bleed. Send help. Blood is always moving around your body. It carries matter such as the gas oxygen, which all parts of the body need, and waste. It also has special cells called platelets. When you bleed, your body sends more platelets to the blood vessel that was cut. Make a clot. Platelets gather together and try to help block the hole in the vessel made by the cut. This is called a blood clot. It stops blood from flowing out of your body. You can help blood clot. Keep it together. Clots are full of platelets and other things to keep your cut closed. Fibrin is thread-like stuff that holds clots together. As days go by, the clot dries out and gets hard. It makes a scab. Crusty scabs. Scabs aren't smooth on the skin. They're dry and crusty. Sometimes they're brown or red and look like dried blood. But they're important. They keep germs and other matter out of the cut while it heals. Working under it all. While a scab covers a cut, the body works hard to fix itself. New skin cells are made to fix the layers of skin that were hurt when you were cut. Blood vessels are also fixed so you won't bleed again. Fight the pus. White blood cells are cells that fight infection. They fight germs near the cut. If it gets infected, though, you might see pus. This is white or yellowish liquid that might come out of a cut. Infected cuts need medicine to get better. Otherwise, you might get sick. Don't pick it. If you have a scab, leave it alone. Scabs fall off on their own after a few weeks. It can take longer for your skin to heal if you pick at a scab. You can even get a scar if you cause more harm. Gravity by Patricia Castle What goes up must come down. Have you ever wondered why you just don't float away when you jump into the air? When you fall, you fall down, not up. Do you know what causes you to slide or roll down a hill? Do you know why a ball you throw into the air falls to the ground? All of these things happen because of gravity. Gravity pulls everything toward Earth. What is gravity? Gravity is a force that acts upon all objects on Earth. It pulls everything toward the center of Earth. Plants, animals, water, and air are all affected by gravity. Gravity is what causes a book that falls off your desk to drop to the floor. It's the force that makes rain fall to the ground. Gravity makes an apple fall from a tree to the ground. Water rushing over a waterfall is pulled by gravity, too. Balance, weight, and the center of gravity. Have you ever balanced objects on a balance scale? The object or objects weighing more will bring that side of the scale down. The object or objects weighing less will be on the side of the scale that is higher. All objects have a center of gravity. The center of gravity is the point where an object's weight seems to be concentrated. To balance an object, the pull of gravity must be the same on all its parts. That means an object balances at its center of gravity. How much does it weigh? Everything is made of matter. The force of gravity pulls on matter. This is what gives an object weight. Your weight depends on Earth's gravity. The moon has less matter than Earth, so its force of gravity isn't as strong. This means you would weigh less on the moon than you'd on Earth. Gravity and exercise. How does gravity act on your body? Your body is always working against gravity. When you stand, walk, or run, your muscles have to fight the pull of gravity. This helps you become stronger and more fit. Every move you make helps you build strong muscles and bones. Gravity helps you keep healthy. Giant Cranes by Kenny Allen Time to lift. Cranes are used to lift heavy things. You may have seen a crane on a farm or at a construction site. Some cranes are on trucks. The tallest cranes help build skyscrapers. The strongest cranes help build giant oil platforms. Rising high. Crane frames are called masts or towers. A mast reaches high into the sky. Many cranes also have a jib. A jib reaches out over the ground. This makes it easier for the crane to lift a load. Ropes and pulleys. 
Cranes use ropes or cables to lift things. Wheels called pulleys allow the rope to move smoothly. The rope sometimes has a hook on the end. The hook is used to hold on to heavy loads and lift them. Hoists. Cranes use hoists. A crane's rope is wrapped around a part of the hoist called the drum. The hoist spins the drum to let out rope. To lift something, the hoist spins the other way and winds the rope around the drum. Tower cranes. Tower cranes often sit atop the tallest skyscrapers. They have long jibs to help lift heavy loads. When a tower crane needs to reach higher, it lifts itself up. Then workers add a new section to the tower. Truck cranes. Some cranes are on trucks. The frame of a truck-mounted crane is called a boom. Tow truck cranes are small. However, some truck-mounted cranes are giant. The tallest truck-mounted crane can lift loads 47 stories into the sky. Overhead cranes. Overhead cranes don't have masts or booms. The hoist moves on an overhead beam. The beam moves on a set of tracks. The crane can pick up something on one side of a factory and move it to the other side. Gantry cranes. Gantry cranes are giant overhead cranes. The hoist moves back and forth on a beam, but the beam doesn't move. Instead, the entire crane moves on wheels or tracks. Gantry cranes lift containers off ships and put them onto trucks. The Tyson Crane The world's strongest crane is in China. The Tyson is a monster gantry crane. It is used to help build other monster machines such as oil platforms. The Tyson holds the top three world records for the heaviest crane lifts. Levers by Dwayne Stilwell What's a lever? Levers are used to lift or move heavy loads with little effort. Levers come in many shapes and sizes, but they're usually long. The longer a lever, the less effort it takes to lift or move a heavy load. Load and Effort This man is using a wooden pole to move a heavy log. The pole is the lever. The log is the load. To move the load, the man uses effort to push down on the end of the lever. What's a fulcrum? All levers need a fulcrum. This is the part the lever rests on. The fulcrum allows the lever to pivot or move in different directions. The fulcrum is in different places depending on the class or type of lever. Class 1 Lever A seesaw is a Class 1 lever. A seesaw's fulcrum is in the middle. The person pushing down on one end of the lever is the effort. The person going up on the other side is the load. Class 2 Lever With a Class 2 lever, the fulcrum is on one end and the load is in the middle. A wheelbarrow is a Class 2 lever. The wheel is the fulcrum. A person lifts the handles to move the load. Class 3 lever. The fulcrum is on one end of a Class 3 lever, and the load is on the other end. A shovel is a Class 3 lever. You hold the end of the shovel, fulcrum, and pull up on the middle to dig up some dirt. In the home. Your house is loaded with levers. Scissors are Class 1 levers. Bottle openers are Class 2 levers. Tongs are Class 3 levers. Life would be very different without these levers in our homes. At work with levers. Many people use levers at their job every day. Pliers are Class 1 levers. Staplers are Class 2 levers. Fishing poles are Class 3 levers. Without levers, many people wouldn't be able to do their job. Levers inside you. We can find levers all around, but they're also inside our bodies. Our bones are levers. They work like all three classes of levers to help us move and lift things. Levers really are everywhere. Pulleys by Madison Miller Into the groove. A pulley is a special wheel used to do work. It has a groove around the outer edge. A rope or cable fits into the groove. The groove keeps the rope or cable from slipping off the pulley. Change direction. Pulleys are used to change the direction of a pulling force. This lets us lift something up by pulling down on a rope. Flagpoles use pulleys. When you pull down on the rope, the flag goes up, out to dry. Have you ever seen shirts hanging on a clothesline between two buildings? This type of clothesline uses two pulleys to change the direction of a pulling force. When you pull the rope toward you, the clothes go away from you. Belts and pulleys. Some machines use belts and pulleys. A belt is like a rope, 
with the ends joined together. When one pulley turns, it moves a belt. The belt then turns other pulleys. Cars used to turn more than one pulley. Heavy lifting. We also use pulleys to lift heavy loads. Sometimes all we need is a fixed pulley. Other times, we use fixed and movable pulleys together. The more pulleys there are, the less effort is needed to lift something. Block and tackle. A block and tackle is a special pulley system. A block is two or more pulleys on one axle. Two blocks with a rope around their pulleys are a tackle. A block and tackle uses many pulleys to make lifting a load easier. You may have seen block and tackles on ships. They're used to raise heavy sails. Big ships need big block and tackles. The more pulleys a block and tackle has, the longer the rope needs to be. What's a winch? A winch is used to pull in and let out a rope. Some are moved by hand. Some are moved by machines. Winches and pulleys work together to lift heavy loads. Elevators use winches and pulleys. So do cranes. Get a lift from pulleys. Do you like skiing? If you do, you've likely used a chairlift. Chairlifts use pulleys to keep the seats moving smoothly. Two pulleys on each end of the lift change the direction the seats move. Screws by Jerry Miller Lots of screws. A screw is a simple machine. You can find screws almost everywhere you go. They're used to hold wood together. Many tools use them too. Some can even be used to move water. Let's find out how. What is an inclined plane? An inclined plane is a flat surface that makes it easier to move something from one height to another. A ramp is an inclined plane. A screw is an inclined plane wrapped around a rod. The thread is a ramp. Around and around. Screws change a turning movement to an up and down movement. That's what happens when you use a screwdriver to turn a screw. When the screw turns, the thread grabs the wood and pulls the screw down into it. Keep it together. Screws are used to hold things tightly together. They're often used to fasten boards together. The screw goes through one board and then into the other. When the screw is all the way in, the two boards won't come apart. Nuts and bolts. A bolt has a thread around it. A nut has a thread inside of it. They fit together. When you turn the nut, it moves up or down the bolt. Nuts and bolts are used to hold parts together and keep them from moving. Tool time. Many tools use screws. A clamp holds two things tightly together so you can work on them. Some people use clamps when gluing pieces of wood together. Some jacks use screws to lift heavy objects, such as cars. Drills and holes. Drills use turning movement to make holes in wood. Drills have parts called drill bits. A drill bit is threaded like a screw. As the drill bit spins, the thread cuts the wood and moves it out of the way. Moving water. Screws can also be used to move water to higher places. When the end of the screw that's underwater turns, the thread scoops up water. The turning movement carries water to the top of the sc screws in the kitchen. Jar lids are held on by screws, one on the jar and one inside the lid. You turn the lid to open the jar. You turn the lid the other way to close the jar. Screws keep your peanut butter fresh. Matt does math at the ball game by Cynthia Rosenthal. Math is fun. Matt works very hard in school. He likes to learn math. Matt knows how to add and subtract at the baseball game. Today, Matt is going to a baseball game with his dad. He loves baseball. Matt can practice math at the ball game. Matt has one ticket to the ball game. His dad has one ticket too. They have two tickets to the game. Matt sees three friends at the baseball game. Then he sees two of his cousins. Matt sees five people he knows at the game. Baseball snacks. Matt and his dad are hungry. They want to buy food to eat. They like hot dogs. Matt holds two hot dogs while his dad pays for them. Then he gives one hot dog to his dad. Now he has one hot dog. Matt's dad also wants popcorn. Many other people like to eat popcorn during the game, too. 
The line to get popcorn is very long. There are five people waiting in the line. Then one person leaves. Now there are four people in line. Play ball. Matt sees the players getting ready for the game. Matt cheers for his favorite team. They're wearing red uniforms. Matt counts nine players on the field. Then two players leave. Now Matt counts seven players on the field. The red team's pitcher throws the baseball to the green team's batter. Then the batter hits the ball. The batters hit the ball with special bats. Matt sees six bats. Then a player takes one away. Now Matt sees five bats. Three players from the red team are on the bases. Then two of the players get out. Now there is only one player on the bases. Matt is sad because the red team only has one run. Then the red team scores seven more runs. Now they have eight runs. This makes Matt happy. The game is lots of fun. The red team wins. Matt and his dad cheer for their team. Counting cars. After the game, Matt and his dad drive home. It takes a long time to get home. Matt counts other cars on the road. Matt sees lots of black and blue cars. He counts five black cars. He counts four blue cars. Matt counts nine cars in all. Favorite sports. Matt loves baseball. He wants to go to another ball game soon. What's your favorite sport? Inclined planes. Hope Colander. What is an inclined plane? Inclined planes help move things from a low place to a high place. They also help move things from a high place to a low place. You can find inclined planes in many places. What does it mean? A plane is a flat surface. A board can be a plane. Inclined means that something is tipped. So one end is higher than the other. So an inclined plane is a flat surface with one end higher than the other. Going up, going down. Inclined planes make work easier. It's easier to move something heavy up an inclined plane instead of lifting it straight up. It's safer to move something heavy down an inclined plane instead of dropping. Ramps rock. A ramp is an inclined plane. Ramps allow people in wheelchairs to get into and out of buildings. A parking ramp is a building where people park their cars. Parking ramps use inclined planes so cars can drive higher and lower. Wee! A playground slide is an inclined plane. When you sit at the top of a slide, gravity allows you to ride to the bottom. A flat slide wouldn't be much fun because you wouldn't be able to get moving. Let's get moving. Movers use an inclined plane to move heavy things into a moving truck. They use the same plane to move heavy things off the moving truck. Using an inclined plane makes the mover's job much easier. Dump it. A truck can hold dirt, logs, rocks, and snow. When workers want to dump the load, they make the back of the truck tip up. Just like what happens on a slide, gravity causes the load to slide out of the truck. Ladders and stairs. Not all inclined planes are flat and smooth. Ladders and stairs are also inclined planes. One end of them is higher than the other. Ladders and stairs help people go up and down more easily. Roller coasters. Do you like riding roller coasters? If you do, then you're riding on some of the biggest inclined planes around. A chain pulls the cars to the top of the first hill. Then gravity pulls the cars back down to the bottom. Measuring distance. T. H. Bear. 
between points. Distance is the amount of space between two points. To figure out how much distance there is between things, you have to measure it. There are many different units we use to measure. Let's learn more about them. An inch, I-N, is the smallest measurement in U.S. customary or standard units. In the metric system, used in other countries, the millimeter, M-M, is the smallest unit. A centimeter, C-M, is 10 millimeters. Units can be converted from standard to metric. Getting bigger. 12 inches equal 1 foot, F-T. 3 feet make a distance called a yard, Y-D. A yard is also 36 inches. In the metric system, 100 centimeters equal meter, M. A meter is also 1,000 millimeters. Using a ruler. You can use tools to measure short distances. One simple tool is a ruler. It usually measures 12 inches on one edge and about 30 centimeters on the other. Yardsticks are longer and measure 3 feet. Miles and kilometers. A mile, MI, is the biggest unit we use to measure distance in the U.S. customary system. A mile is 5,280 feet. Kilometers, KM, are the biggest units of distance in the metric system. A kilometer is 1,000 meters. Map works. Maps have a key that shows a scale to help measure distance. For example, on this map, one inch is equal to two miles. The house is three inches from the school on the map. This means the house is six miles from the school. This map shows some city streets. Use a ruler to measure Main Street. It's three inches long. The map key says one inch represents five miles. That means Main Street is 15 miles long. Some maps use kilometers and centimeters. Let's measure the distance between town A and town B. These towns are three centimeters apart. The map key says each centimeter represents three kilometers. The distance between the towns is nine kilometers. Measuring with money. You can still measure smaller distances if you don't have a ruler. Did you know a quarter is about one inch wide? A dollar bill is about six inches long. You could always use those to measure things in a pinch. Measuring height. T.H. Bear. How tall? How tall are you? Or how tall is the tree outside? We have to measure to find out. Height is a measurement of vertical distance. The tree is probably much taller than you are, but we often use the same units to measure both. The right foot. We use many units to measure height. An inch, I-N, is the smallest measurement in U.S. customary or standard units. 12 inches is also equal to 1 foot, F-T. One tool we use to measure is called a ruler. Most rulers are one foot long. Another tool used to measure height is called a yardstick. A yard, Y-D, is three feet long. That's how long a yardstick is. A yard is equal to three one-foot rulers end to end. Three feet equal 36 inches. Measure that shrub. Let's measure this shrub. It's a bit taller than a yardstick. We need a tool to measure more than three feet. A tape measure is a tool that stretches out to measure things. It's much longer than a yardstick. Feet and inches are used together to measure height. Let's put the tape measure up to the shrub. How tall is it? The tape measure says it's three feet and three inches tall. How many inches is the shrub? Doctors sometimes measure your height using a chart. It might hang on the wall and you stand in front of it. 
The chart tells how tall you are. This height chart says the boy is 48 inches tall. That means he's four feet tall. Rick. Other countries use the metric system of measurement. The millimeter is the smallest metric unit that measures height. There are 10 millimeters in a centimeter. A hundred centimeters make one meter. One meter is also 1,000 millimeters. Let's use metric and U.S. customary units to measure the height of this table. The tape measure shows U.S. that the table is 24 inches tall. We can convert that to metric units. The table is about 61 centimeters tall. What's the story? People sometimes use a unit called a story to measure tall buildings. A story is one floor of a building. It's not an exact measurement, though. Buildings often have different story heights. It takes a lot more measuring to figure out how tall a 10-story building is. Measuring Volume T.H. Bayer Finding the Space Volume is the amount of space an object takes up. All objects have volume. You can measure volume in many different ways. Measuring volume can often be hard if an object has a weird shape. The units. Volume can be measured using many different units. In the United States, the most common measurement of volume is the fluid ounce, F-L-O-Z. You may know the ounce as the unit used to measure the weight of solids, but the fluid ounce is used to measure liquid volume. Other measurements of volume include teaspoons, TSP, and tablespoons, TBSP. They can be converted to other units. One fluid ounce is equal to two tablespoons. A fluid ounce is six teaspoons. A cup, C, is eight fluid ounces, while two cups are a pint, PT. Buying volume. Many things at the store are sold using volume measurements. Milk is sold in quarts, QT, or gallons, GAL. A quart of milk is two pints, or four cups. A gallon of milk is four quarts. This is equal to 8 pints or 16 cups, measuring metric. In other countries, metric measurements are used for volume. A milliliter, ml, measures liquid on a very small scale. It's equal to about 20 drops of water. One teaspoon is equal to about 5 milliliters of liquid. A liter, l, is made of 1,000 milliliters. Odd objects. A graduated cylinder measures liquid volume. Marks on the side of a graduated cylinder measure the amount of liquid inside. You can use a graduated cylinder to find the volume of solid objects, too. Fill a graduated cylinder partly with water. Place a solid object in the water. The difference between the measurement shown after the object is in the cylinder and the measurement shown before is the volume of the object. Let's measure the volume of this. The graduated cylinder has 10 milliliters of water in it. After the rock is put into the cylinder, the cylinder measures 20 milliliters. If you subtract the amount of water you first measured, you know the rock has a volume of 10 milliliters. Other units. Lots of different units can be used to measure volume. The next time you're at the grocery store, see how many things you can find that are measured in volume. Measuring Speed T.H. Bayer How fast is fast? Do you like to run? You may be faster than your friends, but how fast are you actually running? The measurement of how fast something is moving is called speed. Let's find out how to measure it. Speed is measured by figuring out how far something travels over a length of time. We measure time in seconds, minutes, and hours. 
60 seconds is a minute. There are 60 minutes in an hour. A clock keeps track of seconds, minutes, and hours. Speed tools. A special clock called a stopwatch can measure time very accurately. It even keeps track of small parts of seconds called fractions. To use a stopwatch, you press a button when what you're timing starts to move. You press the button again to stop it at the end. Miles to go. A mile, M-I, is a unit in the U.S. customary system. A mile is 5,280 feet, F-T. Miles measure the distance an object travels. When you combine distance and time, you get speed. If a train travels 80 miles in an hour, it's moving 80 miles per hour, MPH. Hours and miles are used even over short distances. If a car travels 10 miles in 30 minutes, what is its average speed? 30 minutes is half an hour, so in a full hour, the car would travel 20 miles. Its speed is 20 miles per hour. Measuring metric. The metric system uses kilometers, km, to measure distance. There are one meters, m, in a kilometer. Speed is measured in kilometers per hour, km, per h. Kilometers can be converted into miles. One mile equals about 1.6 kilometers. One morning, a bus traveled 20 kilometers on its way to school. The bus got to school in 30 minutes. We know 30 minutes is one half of an hour. What was the average speed of the bus? On the water. We use a different unit to track speed when on water. A nautical mile is based on a measurement of Earth's circumference. A nautical mile is about 1.15 miles in U.S. customary units and about 1.85 kilometers in metric units. The speed of boats and submarines is measured by how many nautical miles they travel in an hour. This measurement is called a knot. Unlike the way different countries use either miles or kilometers to measure speed, everyone uses the knot to measure speed on the water. Measuring Temperature T.H. Bayer What's the weather? What's the weather like outside? It's easy to see if it's raining or if the sun is shining, but what does it feel like out there? Is it hot or cold? We need to measure the temperature. The tools. The tool we use to measure temperature is called a thermometer. Some thermometers are made of a tube of liquid. The red liquid expands when the temperature rises and contracts when it falls. Degrees. We use units called degrees to measure temperature. Lines on the side of a thermometer Mark the number of degrees. You can tell what the temperature is by matching the top of the liquid with the degree marks on the thermometer's side. Using Fahrenheit. One temperature scale is called Fahrenheit. It's used in the United States to measure temperature. It was invented by a man named Danielle Gabriel Fahrenheit in the 1700s. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's find out how hot it is outside. The thermometer uses the Fahrenheit scale. Every five lines shows an increase in 10 degrees, which means each line equals 2 degrees. The top of the red line is two marks above 60 degrees. That means it's 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures often change throughout the day. It often gets much colder when it gets dark. Let's measure the temperature at night. The top of the red line is exactly halfway between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you tell what temperature it is? In Celsius. Celsius, C, is used to measure temperature in many other countries. 
Its scale is based on the temperature at which water freezes and boils. Water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Converting temperatures. Celsius can be converted to Fahrenheit. Many thermometers have both scales on them, so it's easy to convert temperatures quickly. This thermometer says it is 41 degrees Fahrenheit. We can see that equals 5 degrees Celsius. What about Kelvin? Scientists use a called Kelvin, K, to measure temperature. Zero degrees in Kelvin is called absolute zero, the coldest possible temperature. Scientists use Kelvin because it easily measures very hot and very cold things we find in space. Where does our food come from? By Deborah Stilwell, on the farm. Most of the food we eat grows on farms. Fruits and vegetables are ready to eat as soon as they're picked. Other foods leave the farm and go to factories. There, the foods are used to make processed food, crops. Many farms grow vegetables or fruits. Some grow a single kind of food, such as corn or wheat. Others grow many different crops. Farms where fruit and nut trees grow are called orchards, farm animals. Some farms raise animals for food. Livestock are animals such as cows and pigs. Birds, such as chickens and turkeys, are called poultry. Dairy farmers sell cow milk. Milk is used to make dairy products, such as cheese and butter. Seafood Some food comes from the sea. Seafood includes fish, clams, shrimp, and even some plants. Fishing companies use large nets or traps to catch a lot of fish all at once. Some fish are raised on farms. At the market some farmers sell the foods they grow at a farmer's market. Markets have bins filled with fruits and vegetables. Some farmers sell milk, cheese, and other dairy products. Some even sell meats prepared on the farm. Food factories. Factories use farm-grown foods to make processed foods. For example, tomatoes are used to make spaghetti sauce. Ingredients are added to processed food for taste or to keep it from spoiling. Some foods are canned or frozen to make them last longer. Shipping food. Trucks, trains, ships, and planes carry food from farms to factories and from factories to stores. Some foods travel hundreds or thousands of miles. Some must be shipped quickly so they don't spoil. Many foods are kept frozen while they're shipped. Grocery stores. Grocery stores sell both fresh and processed foods. Store workers take food off trucks when they arrive. Workers open boxes and place the products where they belong in the store. People from the community buy the food. Feed yourself. Some people don't shop for their food. They grow their own, just as others did long ago. Some people grow fruits and vegetables in gardens. Some raise chickens for eggs and meat. Others catch fish and shrimp. Where does the mail go? By Costin Meyer working for the USPS. The U.S. Postal Service, USPS, is American mail service. Postal workers help the USPS run smoothly. They have many jobs to do. The post office is open six days a week to make sure people across the country get their mail. Addresses and zip codes. To mail a letter or package to a friend, write their address on the outside. Write your own address on it, too. Addresses include zip codes. A zip code tells postal workers what area the mail is going to. Postage You must pay postage to send mail. Buying stamps pays for postage. Most letters need only one stamp. Packages need more. You can pay a worker at the post office for postage. You can even pay postage online, in the mailbox. You might put your mail into a mailbox outside your house. You might use a mailbox on the street. Mail carriers pick up mail from mailboxes. You can also take your mail straight to the post office, through the post office. Workers at the post office help customers. They sell stamps and take your mail. Other workers load mail onto trucks. Many post offices in a large area send their trucks to a building called a mail processing plant. Processing mail. Machines in a processing plant sort mail by size. 
They write lines on stamps so the stamps can't be used again. Machines print barcodes on mail. Other machines read the barcodes, which help them sort the mail by zip code. Mail on the go. The sorted mail is put into trays. The trays are put onto trucks. Trucks take the trays to another processing plant close to the zip code the mail is going to. Mail that must go a long way is carried by airplanes. More processing. At the second processing plant, workers unload the trays. Machines read the barcodes and sort the mail based on where it needs to go. Trucks take the mail to the right post offices. At these post offices, workers prepare the mail for delivery. Out for delivery. Mail carriers load sorted mail onto mail trucks. They drive to neighborhoods and deliver the mail. Some do it on foot. Mail carriers place mail inside mailboxes. They also pick up mail that's going out. And then the process starts all over again. I'm Allergic to Pets by Maria Nelson, all in the family. Does anyone in your family have pet allergies? Allergies are caused by your body reacting badly to matter that's commonly safe for most people. People aren't born with pet allergies, but you're more likely to be allergic if a parent is too. The Causes Dogs, cats, rodents, and horses are the most common pets people are allergic to. These animals' saliva or drool can cause allergic reactions. So can their urine. Most often, though, the animal's skin cells, called dander, are the problem. Dander spreads around the house because animals shed or lose their fur and hair. It sticks to your clothes and furniture. Pet dander is small and can stay in the air a long time. It's very hard to get rid of. What a reaction! Pet allergies can seem a lot like a cold. People with pet allergies sneeze, cough, and get watery eyes. Their nose, mouth, and throat might start to feel itchy. Reactions commonly happen soon after being around pets. Pet allergies are often worst for people with asthma. They'll have a hard time breathing. Whether or not you have asthma, if allergic reactions get worse or last for a long time, it's time to see a doctor. Take the test. Some people are allergic to many pets. Others are more allergic to dogs, for example. A skin prick test shows what's causing your allergies. A small amount of an allergen is placed under your skin to see if a reaction occurs. I'm allergic. Now what? Will you have to find a new home for your pet? It's possible. However, it takes months for your house to be allergen-free. You won't feel better right away and missing your pet. Try some other ideas first. To keep allergies in check, bathe pets often. Give the person who has the allergies at least one room that pets aren't allowed in, such as their bedroom. People with pet allergies should try not to hug or kiss pets too. Staying away from pets is the only sure way you'll have fewer allergic reactions. Some drugs can help, too. Certain kinds of pets are less likely to cause allergic reactions. A lizard or fish could be the right pet for you. Who Does That? by Maria Herrera Community Workers Communities can be very different. Some are in the country and some are in the city. Some communities are on cold mountains and some are in hot deserts. All communities have workers who help meet people's needs and wants. Who are community workers? Police officers, doctors, and teachers are just a few examples. Do you know any community workers? Park workers. Many people visit their community park every day. Some people go to exercise. Others go to walk their dogs or play at the playground. Some parks have basketball courts and soccer fields. Community parks plant flowers, cut grass, pick up litter, and keep parks safe. They use many tools to keep our parks beautiful places to visit. What might happen to community parks without these workers? Keeping communities clean. Many people have jobs that help keep our communities clean. Some workers take our garbage to dumps. Some garbage is taken to a place where it's recycled. Other community workers drive trucks with brushes that clean the streets. These important jobs help keep our communities nice, healthy places to live. Road workers. Cars need smooth roads to drive on. Some community workers pave roads. Other road workers fill in holes. 
Some workers paint lines so that drivers know where to go and people know where to cross the street. Road workers put up signs that help people travel. They also clean snow and ice off roads. These community workers do many things to keep us safe on the roads. Utility workers. Utility workers make sure that water, gas, and electricity reach our homes, businesses, and schools. We need water to drink and wash, gas and electric and cool in summer. They also help us light our homes, cook our food, and play video games. Sometimes storms cut off power. Utility workers act quickly to fix problems and bring the power back on. So many jobs. There are many more kinds of community workers. Librarians help us get books to read. Veterinarians help keep our pets well and take care of them when they're sick or hurt. Some community workers clean our water so that it's safe to drink. Many jobs need to be done in a community. Which job would you like to have? How is paper made? Demi Jackson, an old process. People have been making paper for about 2,000 years. Even after all that time, the process has stayed very much the same. The biggest difference is the use of machines in paper making today. Start in the forest. Very often, paper making begins with trees. Sometimes the trees are grown specially to be made into paper. On tree farms, trees are cut down for paper making and new trees are planted in their place. At the paper mill. After they're cut down, the trees are taken to a paper mill. They're cleaned and their bark is removed. The wood is chopped into small pieces. Now it needs to be turned into pulp. Wood becomes pulp in two ways, depending on the kind of paper being made. For weaker paper, a machine grinds the wood into pulp. For stronger paper, the wood pieces are added to a mix of water and chemicals. Remove the water. The pulp is cleaned and sometimes dyed a color. At this time, the pulp is mostly water. Machines spread it onto screens. Water drips through the screens and the wood fibers start to bind together. This starts to look like a thin mat. Still more water needs to be removed. The wood pulp mat is fed into huge machines with hot rolling parts. These press out the remaining water and create rolls of paper up to 30 feet, 9.1 meters wide. Recycle your paper. The big rolls of paper made in a paper mill are cut into sizes people can use. But what happens when we're done with paper? We should recycle it. Making something new from something used. New paper can be made from the paper you recycle. Used paper is cut into little pieces and mixed with water. This pulp is cleaned and water is removed in much the same way it is when making paper from wood. Plant paper. Paper can be made from plants other than trees, such as hemp and flax. Cotton, which is often used to make clothes, can also be made into paper. Money is printed on paper made from cotton. How paper is made. 1. Trees are cut down. 2. Wood is cleaned and cut into small pieces. 3. Wood is made into pulp. 4. Pulp is spread onto screens to remove water. 5. More water is removed using hot rollers. 6. Paper is cut to the right size. School Around the World Eleanor O'Connor Time for school. Some schools around the world look different than yours. Students there may dress a bit differently, too. As you read this book, imagine what it's like to go to school in these interesting places. Did you hear the bell? It's time for school. School Boats Much of the country of Bangladesh in South Asia floods during the rainy season. That means many schools flood. Students miss classes and get behind in their studies. Some people thought of a way to solve this problem. Floating schools. 
Boat schools mean students can go to class year-round. The boats even pick up students just like a school bus. Some boats have computers powered by the sun. Boat schools can be found in Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Zambia, too. Bus classroom. You might take a bus to school. Imagine if your classroom was a bus. A school in Shanghai, China made a bus into a classroom. The fun idea came from a children's book. It's a great way to recycle a bus, too. Computers to go. In some remote areas of Africa, students don't have access to the Internet and computers. People have made large shipping containers into computer labs for these places. Trucks can easily move the containers to new places when needed. Open-air schools. In some places, there aren't enough buildings for schools. In Afghanistan, schools have been destroyed by years of war. Children often gather in open-air schools to learn. Sometimes they hold class in tents to hide from the sun and rain. What they wear. Many schools in Africa require students to wear uniforms. However, it's not uncommon to see students walking long ways to and from school barefoot. Sometimes they do this to make their shoes last longer. Even in uniform, students may show their culture in special ways. In the Southeast Asian country of Myanmar, students sometimes wear tanaka on their face. Tanaka is a yellowish-white paste made from bark. It guards skin from sunburn. School's out. In the Southern Hemisphere, summer is from December until March. So students in countries there, such as Brazil, have their summer vacation during this time. Would you like to go to school in a different country? Which one? Why?